So next up is uh, Panos Mitru, who is Lloyd's Register's Marine and Offshore Technology and Innovation Manager based here in Paris. Okay, thanks Nick. So I'm going to, we're going to discuss a bit on something uh, which is quite n still niche, but uh, I, with my presentation I will try to provide a perspective on how uh, natural gas increase in as a share in energy markets could create opportunity in conjunction with uh, other gas markets as well. So, first of all, uh, LNG, natural gas in general, and uh, what's all about it? Uh, we've seen quite a drive recently for LNG in numerous uh, uh, forms, but uh, we've seen it in bunkering as well. But what's all behind this? Uh, we have key drivers behind natural gas. The first one coming from its environmental profile, which seems to be excellent. Uh, it coincides with the policies of uh, uh, global organizations or regional organizations like the European Union, etc. Second, second driver behind it is availability. The abundance of resources in natural gas, uh, the revolution of shale gas, the political risk hedging and the Ukrainian crisis, these are all drivers that have led to the better adoption and more swift adoption of LNG and natural gas. And of course, there are several economic factors like favorable fundamentals, the low extraction costs, especially in the case of shale gas, and of course, significant investment that has already been made and needs to be amortized now or will be amortized in the, in the years to come. So we've seen different uh, forecasts. I, I always like to use that one from OPEC, coming from a competitive uh, sort of uh, organization which says that by 2040, natural gas is expected to have the largest share close to 28% of the energy market. In any case, we expect to have a quite large share for natural gas by 2040. So, if we're talking about the fossil fuel of the future and the pricing as it stands now is reflected on this graph, we cannot say we have a mature market there yet. So, practically, uh, you cannot say that uh, on this pricing mechanism, you could base uh, the development of the fossil fuel of the future. But what has changed things? And Natural gas was always there, but what has been the key fact that changed was a game changer? Uh, this was no other than the shale gas revolution, the reserves that have been found. We've seen already this being made in the States, but you can see that there's world, worldwide spread of shale gas. And this led to a 50% increase in reserves in comparison with oil, where shale oil only added 10 to 12% of the global uh, reserves. So with shale gas, we see extraction costs being minimized. And we also saw uh, the by-products uh, trades being maximized as well. The surge of uh, what we call natural gas liquids ethane and the resulting ethylene. So let's take a look of the natural gas current market limitations. We see lack of flexibility. The short term market is not there, is not existing. Uh, as we said, a sale gas leading to a new pricing era. So far we had Russian gas at a certain price with big volume contracts uh, there was no much bother there, but when we saw so uh, cheap prices as the ones we saw the U.S. sell gas uh, in the U.S. sell gas case, then things changed and everybody started talking about investment. So 
We still have the take or pay volume constraint contracts, which are very immature and very, uh, they pose quite a barrier to the development of the market. The pricing still related to the oil price, which is not uh, a natural gas market whatsoever. And practically no means to trade small parcels. So for LNG today, we see only Q flexes, Q maxes. We see parcels of more than 100,000 cubic meters. So is there really a need for a small scale market? The answer could evidently be yes. And the reasons behind it are several. Some of them are the islands cannot be served by pipelines. We have a seasonal consumption that cannot be always catered by pipeline, uh, uh, pipeline rates. Uh, we have isolated regions that do not have access to gas grids, uh, new markets expansion where you don't want to invest too much in a new pipeline yet, the LNG as fuel and the LNG used in transportation in general, we will see more and more cars and trucks using natural gas. Inland waterways, environmentally sensitive areas where permitting for a pipeline is not the best way forward. Spot price hedging and hedging against differences in price. And of course, we will also talk later about flexible power plant solutions. So these are all factors and reasons for the small-scale LNG and natural gas market to, uh, to develop. So, one of the main reasons behind the non-existence of small-scale market is the lack of the transportation means and the lack of ships in particular. We see only 38 ships in general, only 23 totally now operational, and another 15 ships under order. So these are not numbers to serve a global market. So what we see now, we see a surge in designs and construction of LNG dedicated small scale vessels. So this is a table showing a number of designs. You can see here uh, that have been reviewed by Lloyd's Register. Uh, you can see here uh, equal, almost equal terms in, uh, in comparison between type C tanks and uh, membrane tanks. Uh, there are there a number of uh, eight designs ranging from 16.5 thousand cubes to a smaller uh, size of uh, four or less than that. Uh, 2,000 cubic meters. So we've seen already solutions that provide flexibility between different gas segments. And what, what that we have seen is designs covering both or all LNG, ethylene, and LPG. So these kind of ships, they would provide hedged employment risk in the future, a benefit from more expensive segments being employed in, and improved future proofing as far as uh, different market conditions may uh, come up in the years to come. There are a number of considerations about these vessels. One of them is a dual fuel engine, and what kind of fuels someone would consider for this vessel. Multi-purpose operations between bunkering, ship to ship, uh, multi-grades operations and the grade change constraints which right now uh, constitutes quite an operational reason for not proceeding with this kind of uh, not proceeding with this kind of design. So the fact is that shale gas worldwide spread signifies opportunity for both LNG and natural gas liquids like ethane and ethylene and all other LPG trades. Other small-scale solutions, the FSRUs and the floating LNG power stations we've seen. Uh, 
FSRUs, small FSRUs, are flexible, portable, easy to install. You can cater for seasonal, not, not seasonal, but uh, uh, periodic uh, requirements and needs, and then move it to another area around the world. Uh, it is quite practical. On the other hand, floating LNG power stations and small scale LNG power stations provide low cost. They are super efficient thanks to combined cycle uh, gas turbine, a technology that is available due to the use of uh, LNG. So these are solutions that can uh, offer a lot uh, according to the market needs. Getting to the, let's say, more into the core and checking an example of that, uh, we can see the case of East Med about small scale LNG. We have 13 LNG terminals, eight in operation, one FSRU in Israel, and five under development in Italy, Malta, and Greece. Uh, we have practically regions with no access to. To, to the gas grid whatsoever, like Western Greece, Southern Turkey, Cyprus, used to be Malta as well. Favorable, favorable LNG bunkering fundamentals, liner and raw pack routes around the whole area. Four proved fields of natural gas amounting 70 trillion cubic feet of gas already, and the number of areas under development and research. The Egyptian export terminals with an envisaged LNG price at three to five USD per MMBTU. This is quite significant. Uh, we expect to have this kind of price by 2020, but someone should think that this kind of price is competitive to the current price of heavy fuel oil. Nobody says that Egypt will export at this price, but it could do so based on the cost they have. So we have a number of island states like Malta, Cyprus, and Greece, and much societal support and stringent policies to move forward with LNG. And the mission behind all that is to develop a, a healthy, sustainable LNG bunkering and small-scale market which is what we do by the use and uh, our involvement in the Poseidon Med LNG banking project, we had, which has already shown a number of synergies with the energy markets. And if you think as East Med of some opportunity, someone should take a look of the Pacific Archipelago. We have a population of 600 million and 20,000 islands. And uh, the only thing I can add here is that uh, the residential electricity prices in this area are quite significant. So there is a significant profit margin for those power plants we were talking about. So going to the overall small-scale LNG remarks and concluding, natural gas and LNG seems to be taking its place as the fossil fuel of preference in the energy markets, and this is to develop further in the decades to come. Shale gas has been a key driver behind this uptake of natural gas and natural gas liquids. Gas market is still constrained, and the small scale segment is missing practically, and one of the main reasons is the lack of ships. The widespread of shale gas brings small-scale flexible gas carriers closer, and this can be further emphasized by the technology maturity that we expect in the years to come and the minimization of the capex differentials. Uh, we expect also to see a market maturity that will deliver all sorts of employment with bunkering, ship-to-ship, more flexible solution and more flexible ways to employ ships. And of course, multi-grades that could also be the case in different designs of vessels. Last but not least, storage and electricity constitute one of the greatest perspective for small-scale LNG, given the technologies that LNG can support. Thank you very much.
panel, thank you very much. You've painted a very interesting vision of opportunity and uh, hopefully a cleaner future in many parts of the world, not least here in the Eastern Mediterranean. Does anyone have any questions for Panos? Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, I would really ask uh, to what you said uh, about the flexible uh, gas uh, carriers. And my question is, do you really believe that uh, the current size of this flexible gas carrier and uh, the capex of this vessel justifies the current or the future business opportunity? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, no, I, I, I would say that the current fundamentals, the current financials are not very positive, favorable to the capex these ships have. Uh, however, uh, we will see if the market matures, when we see the market mature, like I will, I'll give you an example. If we take the European case, there is already a ship in place which is a flexible carrier. It's coral methane. Okay. Uh, there was a long-term contract and the charterer or the operator, let's say, took the risk of employing a ship of this capex. Uh, we do, I, I would not predict personally that there will be many more charterers that at this stage will charter a vessel in such long-term terms. However, as the market matures and there will be there will be more need for flexibility and small-scale operations, we could see at the same time employment becoming more competitive and gas operators being ready to pay the, the right amount of money to have the cap, capex justified. But at the same time, we expect to see capex being not minimized but reduced due to the technology maturity. Panos, Panos, excellent presentation. Yes, uh, uh, to add something that uh, for the audience, on the list of uh, projects that we have reviewed, there are a few projects missing. Uh, with, I want to highlight with the uh, Hyundai Mipo Dogia, we have uh, we have a couple of designs which has been already approved, and as well we have a couple of designs with STX as well in this small small market. So uh, I, I just uh, wanted to let you know that that is happening. In, in following, up, following up your question, which is a very good question, uh, my, my, my way of seeing how the LNG business uh, will take off is, uh, is with the help of the government. Uh, LNG has taken off in Norway because basically the Norwegian government has been pouring, pouring a lot millions to uh, the industry, to the chip owners, to the different stakeholders. In one way or another way, uh, China and Mr. Lee probably can give us much more insight. Uh, is, is happening something similar. The benefits are there. Uh, I'm going to make a remark here, which uh, maybe is not very political correct. Uh, I am an outsider. Okay, I'm coming from Spain. I have been 20 years, over 20 years, not living in Spain, living in Korea. I came here yesterday. I was walking from the hotel to Overloy's office, and I was looking at all these uh, beautiful passenger ships uh, in the uh, in the port of of Pireus, uh, beautiful ships with ugly black smoke. And we are breathing all of this every single day. China published a, a document, I think that was 2010 or 2011, 2012, uh, where they did an analysis of the number of uh, people who will die uh, just because breathing that kind of pollution in Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, a uh, different port. And, and they analyzed 
what was going to be the benefit for the societies, for basically for all of us, on invest on cleaner fuel, uh, uh, fuels, depending on the ships. So I don't have the answer to your question. Uh, I'm sure that I, I will ask the government to, to provide support. We need to somehow to be politicians, OK? And, and, and ask for that money. I understand from panels yesterday that the, the, the Poseidon, uh, Poseidon project is actually doing a lot of that. Uh, I think that what we need now is uh, brave owners uh, to take the chance to make Pireos cleaner, as a sample. If, uh, if I can play this <laughs> one. Jose, thank you very much.